Hello, Professor Rotsky. How are you doing? Uh, you you are muted. Um, I'm here. Okay, there okay. you go. Good evening and good morning. <laughs> Thank you and good evening to you. Yeah. <laughs> What is it, the different uh, in time, uh, 14 hours? Uh, oh, the time uh, between uh, uh, Reno and, and Poland, uh, I, I think it is nine hours right now. Uh, if I, um, if I, yeah, so, you know, I think both countries went into the daylight saving time or like, you know, you call it this, you know, Central, Central European, uh, you know, summertime, right? Yeah. So yeah, like we are all uh, on the same, uh, like, you know, not all the same, but you are on um, like, you know, that time. Uh, so nine hour difference, you know, between the, um, uh, the two countries or two, uh, you know, like I should say regions. <laughs> Would it be so kind to tell me if I'm good? Uh, I, I have uh, information that uh, as a hot, uh, I'm not, uh, I, I'm not able to uh, share the screen. Okay. So. I, uh, yes, so I will, uh, so you should have, uh, so uh, I see Drew. Uh, Drew, can you give uh, sharing access or should I do that? Um, I think it'll be easier for you to do it because you're the, the host, but I can only see real quick. Yeah, I, I, I will just like make co-host. There you go, yeah. Yeah, there you go. So yeah, uh, Professor Rotsky, you should be able to uh, share your screen now. I will try. I do not know what, what, what should I do to... Uh, so there is a, a, like there should be the share screen button at the bottom yes. uh, of the screen. So it should be like highlighted with green. So- Ah, uh, yes, I, I see it. Okay. Yeah, so you, you click on it and then you basically choose the uh, presentation that you want to share. There you go. Okay. Uh, so that works. Uh, so now you have access. Um, I hope you see the, the title yes. of the screen. Yes, uh, I'm seeing everything, uh, you know, perfectly. So looks great. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, and it is still a little early. Uh, you know, we're, we're of course uh, going to get uh, many more people, but let me see who else. Okay, so yeah, we're expecting Marcin and Beata uh, and Jim Leonard on our end. Uh, I see another person.
Uh, okay, uh, is that uh, Wojtek uh, uh, Trzebinski? Uh, yes, hello, I am here. Hi, hi Wojtek. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, welcome to the session, of course. Uh, so are you Thank the you. presenter for this, uh, uh, you know, for, for your paper? Yes, yes, I'm presenting the, uh, the presentation about abstract and concrete product information. All right, great, thank you. Uh, and, and you're, of course, uh, I don't know if uh, uh, Jim uh, Lenhardt uh, is gonna be here, but uh, you also have uh, Beata uh, Marcin, yes. right? So Yes, and they will be, I, I hope they will be with us. Yeah, let's hope so, right? So, uh, good. Okay, so we have almost everybody except I think Marcin, and you can obviously share your screen okay. Uh, no yes, I, I tried to share my screen and I, I, I have an impression that it was successful. Okay, perfect.
Okay, it looks like we're still uh, missing uh, uh, Marchin. Uh, you know, Pavel, uh, do you know where Marchin is? Uh, let me find out. Yeah, I will come back. No. He, needs to, he needs to test his uh, screen sharing and everything, so. He's coming. Okay, yeah, thanks. <clears throat> okay, I see him now. Hello? Hi, Marcin. Hi, excuse me for being a little late. I, I just uh, had to talk to Beata Mierzejewska, our deputy chancellor, you know Beata. And uh, that's why I, I am a little later. Sorry for that. Okay, okay, great. Uh, is she gonna be also here or? Uh, well, I don't think so because she is doing some other things now. Okay. So yeah. I told her that we meet, but uh, we had to discuss something very urgent regarding Equis accreditation process and- uh, Oh, right, so, right, right. Yeah, I know that's the, uh, uh, that's pretty much like the AACSB Europe, right? <laughs> that is pretty much like AACSB Europe, you're right. Yeah, but both organizations are global. So it's like, you know- Of course, yeah, yeah. That's I mean, true. I think that Equis and AACSB are competing very, very intensively and they both want to be global accreditation standards and benchmark and I don't know. Yeah, well, everybody wants to be global. Of course, uh, you know, like this pandemic uh, has been terrible, like, you know, for international activities, but, you know, it uh, will continue obviously, right? So like, as soon as uh, we see the end of this, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, you know, it's just gonna be back uh, we, to like where we were before uh, or, or like maybe even more than before, who knows? Yes, yes, I agree. I, I also think that probably there is going to be like a boost of people kind of trying to kind of make up for what was somehow lost. Uh, I mean, because we are somehow on hold for a long time now, right? So Yeah, yeah. Mehmet, and uh, I understand we are also waiting for the other people to come, yes, and to join yeah, us. Uh, in terms of presenters, I think we have everybody. So... Um... Like you have, do you have PowerPoint presentation? Yes, I do. Um, you know, can you check uh, if you can share the um, uh, presentation? Okay, just to make yes. Sure. Uh, let me do that now. Share the screen. Yes. Does it, does it does like, that work? Yeah, it, it works. So it looks like it's everything is okay. Okay, so I will stop sharing the screen now. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. I mean, we'll just like you know wait a few more minutes. Okay, so it works. Yeah. <sighs> okay, and I see, uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, familiar names like starting with, uh, you know, Professor Rotsky. Oh, yes. Uh, like who was uh, also there at the beginning, right? So like, you know, when we were uh, like, you know, um, even before we signed agreements, I think there was like, you know, this one summer in either 16 or yeah. 2017. Uh, that's when I uh, actually met uh, Rector Rotsky at the time. So yes. it's, it's a pleasure to have him. And, and uh, I see uh, we just have uh, Elliot Parker, uh, Professor Parker that joined us. Hello, professors. <laughs> How are you? I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hello. Hey, How are you? Uh, hello, Pavel. Hello, Pavel. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm wearing my uh, not tie. Uh, oh, perfect. Right? That's, that's promotion. Actually, yeah. Elliot, I'm wearing the uh, SKL tie as well. So that's yeah, so, so. <laughs> People will think that, oh, like, if not for SKL, these people will not have ties around. <laughs> <laughs> so that's funny. 
How about you, Pablo? Are you wearing yours? Your SK hot tie? No, no, I, I have my keen uh, uh, oh, Nevada, Nevada, United States. That's. <laughs> Do we have a Reno tie? You and our tie, Mehmet? Well, we don't have the UNR tie, but we have a UNR uh, bow tie, don't we? Ah, well, I should get one. I like bow ties. Yeah, we have a bow tie because uh, I think we one time like we brought it as uh, as, as a gift uh, when we visited uh, uh, Poland. Uh, I mean, I kind of vaguely remember doing that. So, but yeah, we should have. Uh, and and by the way, there's a very good uh, tailor that uh, does like, you know, ties in general in locally in town, right? I uh, can't remember his name, but um, yeah, I think originally from Italy and, and uh, you know, he's somehow tied to the, you know, College of Business Network because I keep seeing him uh, like in different, uh, like more like digital, you know, uh, environment. So was that an intentional pun, Mamet? Regarding? That he's tied to the tied to the college of business. Oh yeah, that was not intentional, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Mehmet, you're you're hosting this. I'm going to leave about halfway through so I can go hear Frank's presentation on the uh, concurrent. Yes, uh, yes, and and of course, like I wish I could do the same thing because the other session looks amazing as well. I I just you know went there to say hi before we start here, but. Uh, but yeah, so that's uh, fine. And, and by the way, all of the sessions are being recorded. And, uh, you know, like uh, after like editing, uh, we're going to make it available. So if you missed anything, like you're going to have a chance to um, uh, like, you know, watch, um, uh, watch the presentations again. Wonderful. Okay, so it's, um, well, according to my clock, it is 9am. And uh, we have all the presenters here and uh, we have um, uh, like you know attendees so thanks for joining us uh, today um, so if you um, okay so I uh, am admitting more people here so if you uh, were at the opening session uh, you know you probably heard from me and, and a number of uh, other people but um, but I'll, I'll just like you know introduce myself my name is Mehmet Tosun uh, I'm a professor of economics, uh, but I'm also the director of international programs in the College of Business, and uh, and I'm the, uh, uh, the 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 chair of this session. So, uh, and you know, in this session, um, you know, just to kind of like you know start things off here, um, you know, what we want to do is to like you know uh, talk about um, you know university partnerships. And, and especially, uh, you know, geared towards research, right? So like, you know, joint research initiatives, labs, and, um, uh, and, and like, you know, the importance of, of course, like, you know, university accreditation. And we actually have one, I mean, you may, when you look at the, um, uh, the program, you may say that, well, like this one, this one paper looks a little different than I guess the other ones. Uh, the reason why we included the, um, um, uh, especially this paper by uh, Beata Marciniak, uh, uh, Wojtek uh, Trzebinski and, and uh, James uh, Leonard uh, is that's actually one very good example of joint research between the two universities. So it's a product of uh, like collaboration, research collaboration between the two uh, institutions. So uh, that's of course great to have. So, uh, you know, like, so I, I'm looking forward to all presentations. So uh, without further ado, uh, we're gonna start with uh, Professor Marek Rotsky and for those that uh, don't know him, of course, uh, I don't think he needs the introduction from the uh, uh, SKH end, but uh, 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 Professor Rotsky was uh, Rector Rotsky. So he was the director of SKH uh, when we signed the agreements and even before that. So I, I met, uh, you know, Professor and Rector Rotsky, um, you know, uh, almost like uh, four, maybe five years ago, like, you know, even before we signed the agreement in 2017. And, and he's been also like a very, very uh, supportive of our uh, partnership. And, um, you know, he's been, uh, you know, very important in the collaboration. So we, uh, I should start by, you know, thanking him for all the, uh, the work that he put into uh, the, the partnership and, and his support. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, uh, you know, Professor and Rector Rotsky. Thank you very much. Good morning in Nevada. It's an honor to have the first presentation in this session. I will share my screen.
the aim of uh, my presentation is uh, to show two possibilities uh, of analysis about education quality at Polish universities uh, based on the data related to graduates, in particular, information about the wages and experience of unemployment. One of the sources of information which may be used in the analysis is the Polish graduate tracking system, which is under development on behalf of Minister of Higher Education. The data included in the reports uh, generated by the system concern at the moment the students who graduated in the years from 2014 to 2018. It is assumed that uh, data on graduates from each year would be kept for five years after the graduation. In my opinion, this data indicates the quality of education and may be used to conduct internal analysis as well as to draw conclusions for the third year education system. It can especially be used in order to make a ranking represent, presenting how well the graduates are prepared to start their career after finalizing higher education. The major source of information comes from the social insurance institution, ZUS, and from the POLON system. POLON is an integrated system of information on science and higher education, gathering data on universities, including data on the students and staff. Due to the exogenous uh, character of this data with regard of, uh, to universities, the conclusions drawn from the analysis may be interpreted differently than in the case of surveys based on the questionnaires conducted by the universities. The objects of analysis to be conducted on the basis of the data gathered are groups of graduates of specific field of study who graduated from selected faculty at the university. In order to protect personal data, the analysis do not present results of groups of graduates below 10. The data on university programs are aggregated in such a way that uh, they form joint information on graduates of a given university. It should be, however, noted that the social insurance institution register does not include contracts for specific tasks, contracts made of mandate, contracts concluded abroad, or work without the contract. What is more, the data do not include the information on the job done. It is not known then whether or not the undertaken job is compliant with the completed studies. It seems, however, that in the case of the fields of study characterized by the shortest job seeking, seeking time or the highest wages, it could be assumed that the jobs done by the graduates are compliant with their education. An important factor which makes the conclusions more credible is the information about the share of graduates registered in the social insurance institution. For all universities, it is more than 90% of graduates. The data included in the analysis were of the graduates of the second cycle programs and long cycle programs of the year 2018 of various universities because the majority of graduates of the first cycle programs continuous education. In the groups uh, of graduates defined according to this criteria, almost 130,000 graduates on the second uh, cycle programs, almost 18,000 graduates on the long cycle uh, master programs, altogether from 167 public and 171 private universities. The data uh, adopted for analysis aggregated at the university level do not allow for unification of graduates from various modes of study. As a result, the fates of both full-time and part-time programs graduates have been described jointly. In practice, the bare definition of quality is losing its significance. Instead, the criteria used by quality appraising institutions are becoming more important. 
for instance, in so-called Shanghai ranking, quality of education is never taking into account the number of Nobel Prize winners among the graduates. If we assume that the best university is the one that offers the highest quality of education, we should be looking for a set of factors able to define this quality. The quality of university programs results from the composition, engagement, and competencies of the academic faculty, the quality and scope of the research conducted, the comprehensiveness, the quality, structure, or style of delivery of the, of the curricula, the university infrastructure, the functioning of the study support system, as well as the efficiency of the internal quality assuring system. But there are also reflecting uh, indicators which define the effects of the program quality. These are the data pulled in the graduate tracking system, such as the average time spent seeking the first job, average number of months during which graduates were registered as unemployed, share of unemployed graduates, average monthly wages, etc. However, the synthetic characteristics, the meaning graduate fights on the job market in the graduate tracking system are relative unemployment index and relative wage index. WWB, relative unemployment index, is calculated in such a way that an individual unemployment risk proportion to the average registered unemployment in the district uh, of living is established for the individual graduates in the time period of the study, which is one year after graduation. The value of the index presented in uh, the graduate tracking system reports amounts to average of these proportions. Unemployment risk in graduate tracking system has been defined as an average present percentage of the number of months of the, the amount of obtaining a degree during which graduates remained registered as unemployed. WWZ relative wage index is calculated by establishing for each graduate a proportion of his average wage to average wages in the district of living in the time period of the study. The value of uh, the index included in graduate tracking system uh, report equals to average of these proportions. WWB and WWZ in a synthetic manner characterize the fates of graduates as the irrelevant uh, of the field profile or mode of study and the profession pursued after obtaining a degree indicate uh, graduates' preparedness to compete on the job market and on the other hand, express the market valuation put on the graduates by employers. Graduate success on the job market in terms of short time of searching a job after obtaining a degree and high wages stem from the fact that the university offers and delivers university programs meeting the needs of the society and the economy. Indirectly, it also implies that the university is able to efficiently cooperate with employers on improving study programs and conduct scientific research conductive, conducive to such improvement. It may be thus assumed that WWB and the WWZ synthetically characterize the quality of university activity. It can be used as a criterion components in the ranking. According to uh, these this definitions, WWB is more valuable when it's close to zero. The values below one signify that the unemployment risk of a given university graduate is lower than average. A zero value of WWB means that no one of the graduates in the study period registered as unemployed. The construction and definition of WWB implies that this, is, this index is an inhibitor. Converting it into a stimulus meant modifying its value using the maximum value of the index in the set of the analysis, uh, analyzed universities. WWZ is the more valuable, the highest it gets. So it's a stimulus. Values higher than one signify that wages of a given university graduates are higher than average. 
data analysis shows that the less numerous graduate groups can find their jobs relatively faster. But at the same time, at universities, the impact of the number of students and the quality of studying is lower for high num numbers of people studying. For this reason, it was proposed to correct uh, the multiplication of the modified WWB and the WWZ with a logarithm of the number of graduates registered in the social insurance institution. Applying the logarithm is in line with the weber lefkowitz law. As, uh, the meta criterion of the ranking in future defined uh, is future defined as a multi multiplication shown on this slide. Because of differences uh, in rules of acting of public and uh, not public universities in Poland, two rankings will be presented separately for public and private institutions. The graph presented on the current slide consists meta criteria values for public universities uh, presented on the left and private universities on the right. This table is presenting 15 from 167 public universities with the highest meta criteria values. In this table, PWZ is the share of uh, uh, graduates registered in the social insur insur insurance institution. As you can see, technical and economic universities appear dominant among top universities. In the top 15 universities, there are nine technical universities and four out of five public economic universities. It should be noted that uh, they are offering second cycle programs classic multi-faculty universities with uh, long cycle programs are practically only in the third tenth of the ranking. It could be concluded that the more specialized universities such as technical and uh, economical are better responding to the needs of labor market with, uh, when it comes to graduates. Analysis of the ranking results is pointing out that employers vary more absolvents of second cycle as it is here, but it is easier for the institutions to apply changes to better address the labor market needs. At the same time, a significant part of the students of second cycles are already alumni of another faculty and also another university. This may lead to conclusion that employers prefer graduates with better experience and wider horizons. It is worth mentioning that in the first third of the ranking, there are both institutions with very small number of alumni, like uh, 38 people from University of Applied Sciences in NISA, which in Polish is which within second cycle offers architecture and nurse studies as well as the biggest Polish university, University of Warsaw, with almost 5,000 5, alumni. This table is presenting top private, uh, top 15 private universities. If, uh, in this, if on the university website is the normal English name, I use the Polish name. It should be mentioned that in the uh, case of private universities, it is often difficult to define their profile as they conduct few different faculties, for example, finance and nurse studies. For this reason, in analysis, we cannot take uh, into account, in, into consideration only names of the institutions. For instance, a medical university, our higher school of, plan, of strategic planning in Dobrowa Gornicza and Collegium Mazowiecze. Third in the ranking, Wyższość to Business to Przedsiębiorczości is offering economy and pedagogy, but also nurse program. Besides the previous comment, it can be noted that in case of top of the ranking, there are the universities offering medical and economical programs. Conclusions. In my opinion, the proposed ranking is indicating uh, a possibility to measure quality of uh, education. It can be done by monitoring the alumni on the labor market 
on the basis of data from social insurance institution, which was a goal of this study. It should be underlined that present ranking is objective only considering the proposed criterion. The results can be, however, a starting point to conduct further, deeper analysis. Coming back to the Shanghai ranking, where quality of education is measured, taking into account the number of Nobel Prize winners among the graduates, in my opinion, for national ranking, thinking the data from the postgraduate uh, tracking system is better. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor Rotsky. Uh, th that was um, exactly 15 minutes. So thanks for um, like you know keeping it exactly <laughs> time. <laughs> perfect organization there. Um, so um, uh, you know before I, I introduce the next speaker, um, uh, I forgot to mention, but uh, we have um, uh, some time at the end for like you know questions and discussion. But um, you can actually write your like you know, questions ahead of time in the chat box. So that's okay. We, we just, of course, like, you know, ask that you save the question at the end um, uh, because we're going to have, I think, you know, plenty of time, uh, you know, for a question from the audience. So, but yeah, uh, you can use the chat uh, like a tool at the bottom of your screen uh, if you have any questions for the speakers um, uh, so that the speaker can uh, look at it ahead of time as well. So uh, now the next speaker, uh, you know, is someone that was already introduced uh, uh, also in the, um, uh, opening session, uh, Professor uh, Marcin uh, Wojtysiak Kotlarski, um, and he's going to talk about the uh, the experience uh, of SKH, you know, with the accreditation uh, like uh, process, uh, especially regarding the ASCSP and the uh, ECOS projects, uh, like the benefits, uh, you know, for the business school. So I, I turn it to uh, uh, Marcin. Um, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to uh, continue um, a little bit about the discussions regarding the university management. So I think that my presentation will be like a continuation of a presentation by Rector Professor Marek Rotsky, because I believe that uh, university rankings are also important tools for school leaderships to which is taken into account when managing business schools and also accreditations so here we have like something similar so let me share uh, my screen with you because i also prepared uh, a, a short presentation um, uh, for us which i hope which allow us for uh, tracking those uh, those important things um, Okay, uh, excuse me, can you see my screen, my presentation? Yes? Okay, uh, so, so, so I will continue. So as uh, mentioned by Mehmet, uh, I will try to talk about a little bit about our experience from top international accreditations and some lessons learned that we have from AACS, uh, AACSB and Equis projects. Uh, so, um, Yes. Um, excuse me, I just want to make sure you see the presentation. Is everything okay? It's okay. Yes. Okay, so I will continue. Yes. Yes. Okay, so uh, uh, when a school enters an international accreditation process, you have to do a little bit of self-assessment and trying to see uh, what is the picture of the school as for now? So here uh, on this and the next slide, I have collected like most important things about SGH, which also um, that the, this, this picture is presented to international accreditation bodies. They want to see us, okay? Who, who we are, what is the history of the school? So we are proud to be founded uh, more than 110 years ago in 900... Uh, uh, and six, so at the beginnings of the 20th century. We also present the programs that we have and SGH is having like bachelor programs, master programs, PhD programs, MBA. We are AMBA accredited business school and also post diploma programs, which is like something that is 
specific for SGH. Uh, in terms of students, the number of student body, we are very big because we have like uh, 150, 100 students. So we could be regarded as a relatively very big business school. And our motto is that SGH shapes leaders. In terms of the faculty body, uh, we have uh, more than 800 uh, core and adjunct faculty, which is also relatively big because uh, there could be even uh, business schools which can get uh, one of those top accreditations, which have only 25 um, core faculty holding uh, doctorate degrees. So here we have like a lot more. And SGH is a very internationalized school. We have more than 300 partner universities worldwide and many dual degree programs. So uh, to continue with that picture of the school, just a few more data. So uh, like um, uh, Rector Rotsky mentioned before, uh, you take into account data about your alumni when developing rankings and we can be proud of one of the last ranking of uh, Financial Times, where data is showing uh, that SGH alumni uh, have the highest growth uh, rate as regards salary after the diploma. So this is something that uh, that that could be mentioned, right? So okay, uh, not to talk more about it. This is the starting point. So the current situation of the school. And then I would like to share with you a little bit about those top accreditations. So um, how they, so what, what, what those accreditations are, what can we say about them, right? Because business schools want to be accredited, but there are various accreditations, like various rankings. Uh, so kind of, again, some similarity with the previous uh, paper. Mm. So there are international accreditations, global accreditations like AACSB and Equus, but also more regional accreditations, like for Central and Eastern Europe, we have CIMAN. You also have accreditations on the national level. So this is like the first um, 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 kind of understanding of, of, of those accreditations. But then you can also talk about the scope of uh, accreditations. So there are institutional accreditations which regard practically all domains and processes of business schools like Equis or AACSB. There are institutional kind of slash program portfolio accreditations like AMBA, because this is an accreditation just for the MBA programs of a business school. There are also program accreditations like EPAS, uh, till recently it was changed to EFMD accredited recently or Polish accreditation committee accreditations for a certain program or other special focus accreditations like BSIS, Business School Impact System by EFMD, which focuses on the social impact of the school. So um, having that in mind, uh, we have a certain picture of our school having those accreditations or trying to achieve them. So we are proud to be accredited by AMBA, Siman, and uh, Polish Accreditation Committee. And we are within the process of acquiring Equis, AACSB, and BSIS. So we hope to be really kind of fully accredited relatively soon. And um, so this is like a starting point for my research. And uh, the, the, the paper which I developed for this webinar um, um, is aimed at trying to understand uh, some, some question like how business schools may benefit from being involved in such international accreditation exercises because one may ask a question like why are you doing it guys? Why is that necessary? So, so uh, we believe and many business schools across the world uh, believe that taking part in those accreditations uh, processes can help them be better. But um, I, I, I have developed a paper which is kind of trying to dig deeper into those topics. And I uh, divided my research into three phases. At the beginning, I did a little bit of literature review 
um, of recent literature, which highlights AACSB and Equus accreditation, accreditations, right? So there is a lot written about it, mostly in uh, journals which are devoted to higher education, right? Then uh, the second part of my paper is devoted to presentation those AACS, AACSB and Equus frameworks in form of some summary because it's a lot of body of knowledge related to those accreditations, but I just want to kind of make a short summary for us to better understand those topics. And the third part of the paper is devoted to presenting some lessons learned, uh, which could be drawn from, from those exercises, right? So um, as regards literature review, so a couple of uh, quotations from those um, recent publications, right? So accreditations allow for structuring all operational processes, or they provide a seal or label which differentiates the school from its peers, right? And many other like, or uh, like uh, again, some, some close uh, link to the rankings, it also informs other schools and external stakeholders about educational quality. So if you are high in the ranking, that's probably good. If you have this label, you are uh, e Equus or AMBA accredited, you belong to schools which offer the top educational quality. So this is like, so the, liter the literature is um, really uh, kind of saying a lot of good things about accreditations. And look, uh, here on the next two slides, I also want to share with you some philosophy of those top accreditations. So what is important? Here, an example of AACSB from United States, they have their, it is a global organization, but uh, the headquarters is in Tampa, Florida. So they have like 10 guiding principles and we have them listed here. So ethics and integrity, societal impact, a global mindset, diversity and inclusion, and many other belong to top 10 guiding principles for the AACSB, which should be shared by a community of business schools that are uh, AACSB accredited. Equus is slightly different, but similar. So they have 10 uh, standards. And in terms of those top values or top, top things that they share, so they promote global recognition. Equus allows for some international benchmarking. So you have some strategic advice. So it's, it's nice to, to, to do a little bit of benchmarking and uh, get advice from, from the community of business schools worldwide. So in other words, those two philosophies could be like some guidelines, some, some um, suggestion in terms of how to manage a business school. And then uh, I will conclude with three slides where I present chosen lessons learned, which, which we can drone, I could drone as a, a Equus and AACSB project director at SGH Warsaw School of Economics. So first myth, uh, which you probably could have or you could uh, visualize is that, um, well, um, if, uh, those accreditation frameworks want you to be in compliance in line with some standards. So probably there is very little flexibility in the process, right? Because probably you just have to tick the boxes, okay? I, I am in line with certain standards, which is not true because both AACS, AACSB and Equus allow for a lot of flexibility. So you can, uh, you, you have in mind those standards, but you implement them in such a way that is uh, in line with the context of a given business school. The second lesson learned, which I want to share with you is that, of course, strategy is an important topic here within accreditations. So uh, it is suggested that business schools should ask themselves the following question. So uh, are we a business school for a particular city, for a particular country, for a or maybe for a region, for Europe, or maybe for a continent like North America, or maybe for a world as a whole. 
So um, such questions seem to be extremely powerful. And I do see that many business schools tend to answer this question in the following way, that uh, they are there to solve some world's problems. So I think that there is a tendency that the business school kind of shift from being like locally oriented to be more regionally or internationally or even globally oriented. And this, is, this could be like a second lesson learned, which I want to share with you. And the final one is that, um, uh, which is somehow similar to the strategy lesson learned, is a lesson learned regarding customers of business schools, right? So like uh, President Sandoval mentioned in his initial speech today, business schools are there to serve their communities. Like uh, UNR is serving Nevada and, and probably even the wider spectrum of, 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 of uh, uh, stakeholders, of course. But here, uh, business schools also are kind of prompted by those accreditation frameworks, accreditation exercise to answer a question. So who are our customers, right? Are those students from, from Warsaw, Poland, Central and Eastern Europe, or maybe, or maybe even, even wider? And uh, so, um, so this is what I basically wanted to say today. Uh, I hope that I could share with you uh, a little bit of those uh, suggestions and um, uh, which, 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 uh, which are um, promoted by international accreditation bodies. Uh, I will uh, be pleased to answer any questions later on. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Marcin. Uh, like, you know, uh, very insightful. Like, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm sure like I will have some, you know, questions for you, but like, again, we will, uh, we will do that at the end. <clears throat> so thank you. Um, now the next uh, paper, as I mentioned, is a little bit different than uh, I guess, like you know, the um, the, the previous ones. Uh, but the very important thing, as I mentioned before, is the um, uh, the, the fact that it is a product of uh, joint collaboration between the two universities. <clears throat> so um, presenters, uh, and I, I don't know if you want to do it jointly or if uh, there is only one presenter for that. But I'll, I'll mention uh, all of the co-authors, uh, uh, you know, here, uh, Professor Beata Marciniak, uh, Professor Wojtek uh, Truzebiski, uh, and uh, our, our own uh, Professor James uh, Leonhardt. So uh, who wants to go? <laughs> okay, so I will be presenting. Uh, so I, I will start uh, sharing my screen. Okay, so do you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. So 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 let me start. So uh, this um, this research I would like to present is uh, is done jointly by the team of uh, Warsaw School of Economics and uh, University of Nevada. Uh, so uh, we uh, try to deal with. Uh, uh, marketing dilemma and i would say it is a fundamental one of the fundamental marketing dilemmas uh, whether to communicate uh, our products uh, with abstract or concrete uh, language so uh, for example if we want to sell headphones we may uh, say that our uh, headphones are comfortable which is abstract or we may say that our headphones are have an optimal shape, which is a con which is concrete. And uh, uh, when we uh, say something abstract about our product, we may be more connected with uh, goals, values, motives of our customers, uh, of our consumers. So we are closer to their perspective. But on the other hand, uh, many studies show that um, abstract messages may be perceived as uh, more vague, less trustworthy, and so on. So 
as you can see, it is really a dilemma. And the existing literature offers some possible moderators. For example, uh, it has been demonstrated that uh, consumers who are more knowledgeable in a product category um, uh, prefer more concrete uh, product information while uh, consumers who are more aware of a brand prefer more abstract information. Uh, also, uh, there, there, is, um, uh, there, is an there is evidence that uh, hedonic products are um, communicated more effectively by abstract, with abstract language, and utilitarian products are communicated more effect, effect, effectively by uh, with um, concrete um, uh, language. Um, also, uh, there is a possible moderator uh, which is called consumer mindset. So, when uh, a consumer attempts to uh, buy a product, uh, they may be in goal-oriented mindset, meaning that they think more about their goals, or they may be in more comparative mindset, meaning that they think uh, primarily about products. So they are focused on comparing, on choosing the right product. And uh, the literature suggests that uh, the comparative mindset is more related to concrete product information. And we uh, take that, uh, that notion and we propose an additional moderator uh, in the form of evaluation mode. Uh, it means that uh, products may be uh, presented to consumers uh, either uh, jointly or separately. And uh, prior research suggests that um, uh, this evaluation mode may um, shape the way uh, different um, attributes uh, influence uh, the um, response of uh, consumers. But as far as we know, there is no research explaining the link between abstract uh, and concrete information and uh, evaluation mode. So we want to um, bridge this gap, uh, proposing that in joint evaluation mode, um, uh, consumers are more in comparative mindset. And therefore, abstract product information is less easily processed and therefore, abstract information is less persuasive. So in our research, we manipulate two variables. We manipulate um, the abstractness of uh, product information and a uh, product evaluation mode. Uh, so we, um, uh, we uh, did a study uh, in uh, an experimental design of three conditions. Uh, so we have one joint evaluation condition and two separate evaluation conditions. Uh, the first separate evaluation condition um, uh, contains an abstract superior alternative. And the second uh, separate evaluation condition contains a concrete superior alternative. And as you can see at the bottom of the slide, uh, the abstract superior alternative is depicted as superior in terms of abstract information. So for example, high comfort in general. But this alternative is also depicted as of standard performance in terms of uh, concrete information. So for example, standard shape. Uh, and we have also the concrete superior alternative, which is uh, depicted in the opposite way. So 
it is depicted as um, superior in terms of concrete information. So for example, optimal shape, but it is depicted as, a, as of standard performance in terms of abstract information, for example, standard comfort in general. So here we have attribute trade, meaning that uh, in within one product alternative, we have both positive information and negative information. And we considered this, um, this stimuli as uh, more realistic and more engaging our participants. So in our um, study, we measured mainly three things. First, we measured uh, product thought, which is the degree uh, to which consumers uh, think about products, in this case about headphones, while, uh, while considering a product offer. So the higher is product thought, the higher should be a consumer mindset. So product thought should indicate a, a comparative consumer mindset. Next, we measured uh, information processing fluency. So uh, we, we checked uh, how easy it was uh, to uh, process uh, abstract or concrete information for our participants. And third, we measured the purchase intent. So we checked uh, what is the intention to buy uh, the abstract superior alternative and uh, to buy uh, the concrete superior alternative. And um, we... Um, obtained uh, uh, very interesting results. So first, uh, um, the product thought was higher in the joint condition, which is in line with our expectations. Second, uh, we find no significant differences in um, information processing fluency. However, we found uh, the effect on uh, purchase intent. And this effect is opposite to our expectations because we predicted that in joint evaluation, the abstract superior alternative will be um, less, um, uh, less intended to buy, uh, but the results show something opposite that in the joint uh, condition, uh, the abstract superior alternative was uh, more preferred. And uh, our, our thoughts about that is that first, our results supports our, uh, our, uh, our model in terms of product thought. So in line with our model, in joint evaluation, uh, in, in the joint evaluation, we have more, um, more, we have higher product thought, which indicates a more comparative mindset. And this result is quite interesting and I think valuable. Uh, in terms of information processing fluency, uh, as you, as you remember, we, we have no significant uh, results and we think that it may be caused by the fact that we presented uh, two types of information in one product description. So for example, abstract product description, uh, I mean the description of the abstract superior alternative contains uh, both uh, abstract information and concrete information. So for our um, participants, it might be difficult to assess processing fluency for those two types of, um, of um, information. Uh, and third, uh, and I think it's the most interesting part, uh, for purchase intent, 
uh, the fact that we uh, obtained uh, the opposite uh, direction of, of the relationship may be caused um, by the fact that uh, when we have the positive abstract argument, so for example, we see a product description saying that there is high comfort in general, it may seem vague when we look at only one product with this uh, positive abstract description. But if we uh, see two products and we see the second product in which we have the negative uh, abstract argument, so we see that in this second product, um, uh, comfort is standard, is not high, but standard, it may uh, make us thinking then the uh, comfort is a non-trivial feature that we may have high comfort, but we may also have a standard comfort. So mm, the abstract um, information, which is, um, uh, let's say by definition more vague, may be uh, perceived less vague when contrasted with the negative abstract argument for some other product alternative. So it may, uh, it may explain this uh, uh, surprising effect. And in our further research, we would like to explore that. So we would like to explore how this attribute trade-off trade -off effects operate uh, so it it is um, about this effect I I described uh, I described a moment ago, but uh, there could be also some other possible mechanisms. And the second thing we want to do in our further research is to try to uh, try um, to uh, uh, support uh, try to test the effect of uh, joint evaluation on abstract process fluency with no attribute traders. Because when we uh, present pure abstract or pure concrete description to our participants, we hope that they, uh, that there will be, um, it will be more easy for them to assess process fluency. And we hope that in this situation, we may uh, be able to uh, to to verify uh, this um, uh, this uh, effect we uh, predicted in our model. So thank you very much. Uh, if you are interested, if you have uh, questions, uh, we will be happy. Um, of course, if you want to contact, if you want to write to us, uh, you are you are welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Wojtek. Uh, can you uh, stop sharing? Of course. All right. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm sure there will be questions, and I, I'm actually wondering about one thing, but, but again, I, I'll um, uh, like wait until the end. So the next speaker is actually me, and I already introduced myself, so I will just like go straight into my presentation. <clears throat> And my presentation will be, um, you know, uh, to some extent along the lines of uh, uh, what, uh, you know, Professor Rotsky and, and uh, Professor um, uh, Kotlarski uh, talked about. So let me make this. Okay, so, um, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, my, uh, uh, presentations about research labs in business and economics, uh, and and uh, like um, uh, specifically the case of uh, this new lab that we established called the MV Global for short. Um, so uh, let me start by talking about uh, like you know the research labs in business and economics, like where we are, like you know what is the use of having labs, you know that kind of thing. So first of all, you know labs are important for both faculty and students, right? So um, uh, we know this also from the science, uh, you know, like uh, subjects and disciplines that they, uh, like we've seen in science, engineering, you know, health, 
uh, you know, a, a lot of lab related work that involve both faculty and students. So, you know, obviously this is nothing new, but it is thought to be not happening for business and economics, which is uh, not true. So I will actually show you some numbers uh, on that too. So uh, what are some of the, uh, the benefits? Well, faculty and students connect in those projects, right? So like the connection between faculty and students, and I'm not talking about uh, just in a classroom setting because yes, of course they come together in the classroom, but you know, uh, that's not really enough, right? So like we, uh, that, that's the traditional lecturing method that uh, has some interaction between the, uh, the faculty and students, but it is, um, you know, focused on learning a certain, uh, you know, theory, certain material. Uh, it is not exactly hands-on, uh, like, you know, type uh, interaction. So, you know, connecting the faculty and students, important, right? Uh, students uh, receive project guidance, you know, from the faculty. So that's important because that's, uh, we're, we're talking about, you know, young uh, people uh, that are learning, right? So they're kind of, uh, they could be in the, uh, at the very early stage of their learning process. So they need guidance. And so they get that. But also like they get uh, more broadly career advice. So they may say, you know, hey, I'm looking at this uh, you know, I, I'm very interested. Maybe I will uh, uh, do more graduate study about this subject, or uh, I'll be uh, working on, uh, like you know, this in the the private sector or the government sector. So they they uh, uh, kind of like uh, start exploring these ideas about what to do next in their career, right? Well, of course, faculty uh, benefit from uh, getting the research assistance from the students. So that helps with their publications. So they may be, you know, uh, eventually co-authoring papers with, uh, uh, you know, with, uh, with those students. They help them with their grant work, uh, like, you know, getting the grant because it's always, uh, you know, appealing uh, like to funding agencies to involve students in projects, uh, but also like, um, you know, help uh, faculty with um, like, you know, uh, 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 completing their grants, right? So doing the grant work. So students also learn critical thinking, problem solving skills, data skills. And again, as I mentioned before, they explore different areas that they like. They may say, okay, I tried this, I hate doing this. Or they may say, oh, I love this, I would like to do more of it, right? So um, actually in a way, the sooner they come to that realization, the better. And um, you know, labs are not just for science, engineering, health, it is for business and economics as well. So. Uh, I will start by saying that uh, uh, you probably are hearing about uh, like a lot of behavioral research in social science, including business and economics, right? Um, behavioral economics, behavioral finance, you know, in my field, uh, behavioral public economics with, uh, you know, experiments done about, uh, you know, public goods, uh, about like, you know, tax compliance and, and things like that. Actually, we had a a very good uh, speaker, uh, like in you know, a few weeks ago, uh, who is an expert in experimental research uh, about tax evasion, and then like you know um, uh, those people actually do, you know, experiments in lab settings to understand like you know you know what are the factors that uh, you know make people comply with uh, with, with taxes uh, or not, right? So some examples. Uh, so as I was like you know uh, searching this, and I actually wrote a a blog about it. I'll be happy to share that with you. Um, so you have a Bloomberg Business and Economics Lab. So there you go. It's actually a lab that has business and economics in the title uh, from Brandeis, Real-Time Analysis Investment Lab from Stanford, Business Innovation Lab from Northwestern. So these are, of course, like, you know, very well known, uh, like research universities in the US. The Economic Science Laboratory from Arizona. Arizona is known for experimental research. You know, Wharton Behavioral Lab from UPenn, uh, Experimental and Behavioral Economics Laboratory, uh, UC Santa Barbara. And actually, uh, I, I wanted to also bring it up because some of our faculty in our, uh, in our college, uh, they, uh, you know, um, uh, they, they collaborate with uh, researchers from UC Santa Barbara. And we have sent uh, like graduate students there in the past as well. Um, International Business Agility Lab. So some of these labs have international orientation, so such as the one in University of Maryland. And I wanna point out one thing, uh, there's a website. So when I was uh, uh, searching in the internet, uh, so I found this website 
it was actually titled uh, Game Theory. Uh, you know, that was the name of the website. So I said, well, okay, Game Theory, uh, you know, but they specifically had a section about labs and economics because some of these, um, you know, uh, experimental research could be about uh, like, you know, game theory, right? Uh, which is sort of this marriage of uh, mathematics and, and economics. And they list uh, on their website, they list 151 economics labs, but they say economics, but some of them also have the business uh, in it, um, in tw 27 countries with, uh, of course, US leading the group with 52 as a single country, but there's a total of 75 in Europe. And there's, a, I, I saw that there's at least like one uh, like, you know, from Poland, unfortunately, not the, uh, the new economy lab. I think it's because it's probably new and it didn't, you know, make it to that list yet. Uh, and our, you know, lab is not there yet either. Uh, you know, uh, but yeah, so there, there are like a good number of uh, labs uh, in Europe. And if you're wondering about the, uh, the spread uh, or the distribution, um, you know, um, in, in different countries, here's what it looks like. I actually did this quickly using Google Maps myself. Um, so you see, of course, big cluster in, uh, you know, North America, like, you know, mainly in the U.S. Uh, and, and, and especially uh, the clustering in the East Coast of the U.S. But of course, in the West as well, like, you know, uh, because of the existence of, of some prominent universities. You know, not much happening in uh, Central or South America, but it could be because uh, uh, this list doesn't include. So um, I'm sure there are some labs there as well, but maybe they didn't make it to the list. And then, of course, like, you know, big concentration in Europe, some in the Middle East, right? Um, you know, not much in Africa, you know, with the exception of, uh, I believe this one is in Kenya, and then you have in South Africa. Uh, and then, of course, like some in East Asia and um, Australia and New Zealand. So, um, you know, it is, you know, uh, in a way like what you expect, but also it makes the point that to the extent that this is, of course, uh, you know, um, uh, true, so you seem to have uh, a lack of these, uh, you know, uh, labs in business and economics in some parts of the world as well, like such as uh, large parts of Africa, uh, Central South America, and uh, like, you know, big chunk of Asia as well. Okay, let me come to our lab. So we establish the Nevada Global Business and Economics Lab, ME Global for short. Um, uh, this was actually announced uh, during uh, the trade and education mission that was um, that was organized by the uh, uh, Nevada Governor's Office of Economic Development, GOED, um, and it was a mission to you know four different European countries. So it was a Europe-focused uh, trade and education mission. So we announced this in a global summit that was um, organized by GOED on March 6, uh, 2020, and and I, I wanted to put the exact date because. That probably is going to catch your attention. That was right before the uh, WHO declared COVID-19 a pandemic, like literally five days, uh, you know, like you know before that. So that's that's an interesting time. So in the nick of time, we were able to do this like wonderful trip, uh, like you know with uh, this important announcement. But you know, of course, there were delays. So uh, the uh, the lab was formally launched in fall 2020. Um, uh, now, I, I need to emphasize that this is a virtual lab. So it is a, a very flexible, you may call it a loose arrangement, right? So we don't have a physical center, uh, you know, but during the pandemic, it turns out that that's actually a strength, and not a shortcoming, right? So like, you know, you uh, are very limited in terms of uh, physical presence. Uh, you need to do a lot of things in the virtual environment. Well, you know, this symposium is the perfect example of that. So. Uh, that actually virtual uh, lab uh, characteristic is, I guess, uh, is, is, is important and in it worked well for us so far. It's an applied research. Uh, so we're open to, of course, like a variety of uh, topics uh, like in business and economics, but it is more like applied research orientation and also policy orientations. Right? So a lot of the work that we plan to have and we are having already right now you know, have policy implications, you know, helping policymakers with uh, like, you know, with, with their, with their like a variety of their uh, policies, right? So like uh, government policies, but also like corporations, uh, you know, and other agencies, other stakeholders in the, in the society. Um, 
and it has the internationalization goal. It's a global lab, right? So, you know, our, uh, you know, uh, motive is, of course, like research, bringing faculty and students together, but also bringing, uh, you know, um, those faculty and students from UNR and our partner universities. So uh, internationalization is, uh, is an important goal of the, uh, of the lab, obviously. So the students uh, work as research associates with uh, faculty mentors. Uh, so we already have few uh, like examples of that I'm gonna show you in a minute. We are organizing the lab around working groups. So, so far we have two of those. And, uh, and of course, like, you know, we are making use of research events like this, uh, like such as symposium, uh, like, you know, webinars, uh, and of course publications and a new uh, a policy brief series that we just launched. I mean, we don't have anything to show, so I don't have the first uh, policy brief yet, but, but it is uh, coming very soon. Um, and, and this also allowed us to do some new research partnerships, such as the one with the World Bank. Uh, we have done two webinars with the World Bank, uh, you know, of course, uh, with our own, uh, you know, Governor's Office of Economic Development. Uh, you know, we established like this nice link with uh, Ituna Center, which is a center focused on the, the Basque Economic Agreement and Fiscal Federalism, uh, which is at the, uh, the University of the Basque Country. So we have a great relationship with, uh, uh, you know, a couple of universities in the Basque Country. And, um, and of course, like last but not the least, uh, the new economy lab at the SKH Warsaw School of Economics uh, with the uh, leadership, uh, you know, uh, from uh, Professor Marcin uh, Kotlarski. So, um, I'm uh, running out of time, but yeah, I just wanted to show you some uh, screenshots from our website. So as you see, like, you know, how we are organizing the, um, like, you know, the lab around, uh, you know, working groups, you know, distinguished lecture series that we uh, started in spring, uh, you know, webinars and, and policy briefs. Um, like in the, in terms of the working groups, we have two right now. One is called the Global Entrepreneurship and Public Policy. And the other one is, um, Public Finance, Tax Policy, and Economic Development Group. And um, uh, we have under both, we have these partnering institutions such as uh, GOED, uh, such as uh, Coach Universities, uh, you know, KWORKS with the Entrepreneurship Center, uh, the, our own Osman Center for Entrepreneurship, and the, the new uh, grant initiative in, um, in, in Poland, the Gospol Stratek. Uh, you know, I, I think I'm saying, I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, and of course, um, you know, as I mentioned with, uh, uh, with the webinars, the World Bank, the Center for Bus Studies, the Ituna Center, and uh, we have a University Center for Economic Development, and of course, go ahead. So these are all partnering institutions in our, uh, in our working groups, you know, under the MV Global. You know, here's a, a you know, couple uh, screenshots about uh, the World Bank webinars, and you will see some familiar names, including, of course, you know, Dr. Bitrashiansky, so that was actually a a special uh, presentation about Poland. And this is uh, done jointly with the, uh, the World Bank's, uh, you know, governance, uh, uh, you know, global solutions group that uh, focuses on decentralization research. And uh, you will see some uh, students involved in this. And speaking of students, here's a list of uh, students involved in, in, not in only in the webinars, but also in our, uh, like, you know, research under the MV Global uh, like, you know, and, and this list actually includes both undergraduate and graduate students. In the case of uh, the first student you see there, Claire Burkhardt, she's actually a high school student uh, in the Davidson Academy, uh, which is this, uh, you know, wonderful school, uh, like, uh, that is, that actually is placed in our campus, uh, you know, that has, uh, you know, the talented and gifted uh, program uh, for students. Uh, yeah, finally, uh, the Distinguished Lecture Series, uh, you know, we had, uh, we launched this in the spring and we had already three wonderful lectures. I just want to bring up uh, this last one that we had, uh, where we had um, uh, uh, Mary C. Daly, who is the president CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank uh, in San Francisco. And she actually sits in the, uh, the Federal Open Market Committee. So, I mean, I guess literally, like she's one of those that is, uh, uh, that is uh, contributing to the um, monetary policy in the U.S. and and you know through that of course like you know uh, like influencing or impacting the global uh, you know um, uh, like you know uh, money uh, supply issues. So uh, I will end here uh, so that we can actually go to some uh, questions.
uh, from the audience. So I'll do stop sharing. All right, so um, we have more than 20 minutes. Uh, so I think we are in pretty good shape. And um, okay, so uh, I, I have, uh, okay, so I have one question, I guess uh, in the chat box, but like uh, who wants to go first? So if, and, and it, at this point, um, like, you know, you can open up your camera, you can unmute yourself and then, uh, you know, verbally ask the question. So uh, for instance, I see the, a question from, uh, uh, you know, Pavel Petrashiansky, uh, you know, Pavel, do you wanna kind of like, you know, ask your question? Um, yes, 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 of course. And this is the question specifically directed to Professor Marcin Wojtyszak Kotlarski. And the question is, uh, is triple accreditation worth pursuing so-called triple crown as only a few universities in the US and Poland have it, but surprisingly quite a number from UK universities. So is it worth to pursue three of those accreditations uh, in your opinion? Is this the right, right strategy to do? Thank you. Thank you, Pavel, for this question. And I believe it's a very important one uh, because yes, it's widely debated these days whether uh, business schools worldwide should pursue this goal. So by Triple Crown, uh, as you uh, have started talking about it, we understand the top three uh, international accreditations. Two of them are AACSB and Equis, which are institutional, so cover uh, uh, mostly uh, cover generally all, all processes of business schools. And one relates to the portfolio of uh, MBAs. And yes, um, uh, I would agree with this claim, uh, Pavel, uh, because um, uh, especially for business schools or universities of business and economics, uh, which uh, focus uh, on uh, international customers, students, right? So if uh, your strategy, if a strategy of business school is really to be, um, um, to be very international, then especially for such schools, it is important, right? Because um, one of the reasons for that is that international students uh, perceive those stamps of AACSB, Equis, or AMBA as um, a guarantee for high quality of education. So uh, I believe that it's somehow similar to rankings again, right? Because if you're high in the ranking, then, then um, probably uh, higher the chances are that uh, prospective international students will choose you. So, so that, 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 that's how I see that. It's, it's, it's a good goal. It's a good uh, strategy, I, in my view. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and, and I had a kind of a, a related question to uh, uh, Pavel's. So yeah, I mean, like, you know, these um, like triple crown um, and even like, you know, the regional accreditation, you know, it gets confusing after a while, right? So like you, you start saying that, well, like there's gotta be an optimal like, like number of uh, accreditations. And, and I, I'm wondering, you know, I'm sure like, you know, uh, every, you know, group is, um, like defending its own brand in a way, but I'm kind of like wondering if there's any kind of like talk about consolidation of uh, uh, like, you know, some of that, uh, some of the accreditation, uh, you know, groups or, or like, you know, processes. Uh, well, uh, I, can, I can share some opinion. Uh, so um, at the moment we have two uh, most important global accreditation bodies and these are AACSB which is the oldest one and was founded in the USA and EFMD, which is from Europe. But uh, in my view, both organizations uh, become similar. So they focus on global, uh, on global uh, scene. And uh, so AACSB wants to, uh, uh, initially American, wants to be closer to Europe and Asia, and the FMD develops to uh, USA, Americas, and Asia. 
So, uh, but for the moment, uh, I think that those organizations are competing. But interestingly, we have seen recently a change of AACSB, uh, which uh, changed its um, standards. So uh, before the change, they were 15 accreditation standards by AACSB. Now they changed to nine. And in my view, they are very similar to 10 Equis standards. So probably this consolidation is possible, but I don't see any, any evidence so far, Mehmet. So we will see. So maybe if not consolidation, some sort of uh, convergence, at least like in terms of the criteria and the principles and, and all that it's stuff. For sure. This is happening. Uh, you know, great. And, and I guess um, uh, maybe a, a quick, uh, you know, follow up also, um, you know, uh, so uh, unless I, I missed that, um, you know, listening to, of course, also Professor Rotsky's presentation and yours, uh, like there's also this, um, uh, like, you know, the SAMS, the Masters in International Management, uh, like the SAMS group, which is kind of like this elite, uh, like, um, you know, group of universities with the um, uh, like almost the standardized masters, like in a program, right? Um, that's got to be, you know, uh, signaling quality as well, right? So like in a way, um, and I, I, you know, I was curious about this. I was uh, checking in our, you know, partner university group. Uh, we have only two partners that has this. It is uh, like, of course, one is you uh, or SKA and the other one is uh, uh, Coach University in Istanbul. So, uh, and I say, well, that's got to be impressive. And I believe it is like 30, about 30 uh, universities around the world that has this, uh, that, that belongs to this sort of club. Uh, it's not the same thing as accreditation, but it's, it, it looks like a, you know, pretty impressive, uh, you know, group. Yes. Uh, so we are proud of uh, being part of uh, TSEMS Alliance. And within this, we offer a master in management program, which is kind of, co-developed with the whole alliance. So uh, um, I uh, am, I have uh, this opportunity to be teacher within the SEMS Master in Management program. And I can tell you that I observe that those students who are part of this program are extremely ambitious. And uh, so it could be given as an example of um, kind of an elite program. Of course, every program at SGH is uh, meaningful, but but there is this uh, specifics of Sam's meme. So, but, 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 but anyways, it's a slightly different thing, right? Accreditations and, but, but it's, it's a form of how uh, business schools collaborate. And, uh, and this is uh, so important, I think. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, now, any questions uh, for, for um, any of the presenters? Maybe not a question, but a small addition to the speech of Professor Wojtysia Kotlarski. You should know that in Poland, accreditation made by Polish Accreditation Committee is obligatory. It's not like voluntary accreditation made by CEMS or FEMD. And what is new uh, in, uh, in our new uh, law about uh, higher education. We have no institutional uh, accreditation, which was uh, accreditation of uh, faculties. Nowadays, we have complex accreditation, which is accreditation of universities as a whole university. It's a completely new product. So. Nowadays, I, th I think nobody knows uh, how to it, it will be done and work. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you for that note, uh, Professor Rotsky. Um, uh, other, other questions? Uh, actually, I have one to the chair of the session. So do Dr. Dawson, to, to, for, for you. It's uh, uh, regarding those labs and uh, about uh, uh, the question is, uh, of course, maybe two parts of this question. One, uh, uh, you were talking that you were uh, identifying through uh, Google search those labs, uh, uh, which were uh, basically what you found. And uh, do you have any, uh, um, any information, uh, let's say, uh, 
how it was that, that those labs were searchable and you, you found the results. And some of them like uh, very be beginning. So first of all, congratulations for your en en Envy Globe. And we are, we are uh, very uh, honored to, to be a part of it. But uh, for example, uh, one of the deliverable from Nava Grant uh, new, new Economy Lab is, uh, is also the, uh, the ex existence of such a lab, uh, maybe with, with, without, uh, I would say, uh, certain transformation yet to the, to the very uh, firm and uh, existing and formal, I would say, lab. So the question is, uh, do you know any uh, requirements to, through your research? You found something like uh, what is, uh, what it sh really should be done to, to have this, this lab as a, um, as a listed one? Uh, yeah, that's a good question, Powell. And um, like, you know, uh, I think we are all kind of like new in the lab business, but, uh, but yeah, I can tell you that it's, you know, a little bit all over the place. So I, I don't think that there's like a common, you know, criteria that, well, like, you know, here is like, you know, what you are supposed to do to become a lab. And, uh, you know, uh, when I was like researching this, like it's, uh, there, there's a great variety. I mean, like you have labs that focus on like literally doing experiments in person, like, you know, with students, you know, with uh, others. Uh, but, but some of the labs, uh, like, you know, let's say focus on uh, financial side, like, you know, trading labs. Uh, like I, I even like, you know, saw uh, one lab uh, where the focus was uh, like, you know, case competition between undergraduate students. And I thought that was also interesting. So, I mean, I, I see kind of a great variation in this, but, uh, but I, I maybe one sort of like, you know, common theme is, uh, yeah, like definitely bringing students and faculty together, right? So uh, like, and, and that's basically um, uh, uh, to some extent, like, you know, what we see also in common with the, you know, other scientific labs that um, like, you know, uh, both sides, uh, you know, benefit from it, uh, from that interaction. And uh, like, but other than that, I, I think it's uh, it's really up to the, institution um uh, there's no like accreditation body that is i guess like you know specifically for the labs at least you know not that i'm aware of um and i don't know like what let's say uh, this um, you know website that i found uh, i don't know like their criteria for including uh like you know these labs in their list uh, they do not mention uh you know anything so it is i think pretty ad hoc but uh, maybe one uh, final thing i'll mention is um, you know, as as uh, as Geha is also doing, we are uh, part of this network uh, that is um, done by the Harvard Business School, the Microeconomics of Competitiveness. Well, it says microeconomics, but it is like broadly for the business. So uh, there's a this, there was a discussion there in their last meeting uh, about um, like uh, they have like hundred plus uh, you know countries and universities involved in that network. They there was a discussion about. Um, you know, bringing some sort of um, standards, uh, like, you know, to the labs, uh, they say, I think labs and centers, uh, they probably include also centers, uh, to be part of that network. But they said, oh, like, if it is just on paper, you know, we don't want it. So we want, you know, the, uh, the labs to do actual work. So that's probably the, you know, uh, the first and so far, the only discussion I, I came across about you know, maybe bringing some standardization about like these research labs so that we can, uh, we can say that, well, hey, you're, if you are in this group, you must be meeting a certain criteria. Uh, but so far, you know, it looks like we're not there yet. Mehmet, if I could jump in just for a second regarding this uh, notion. Uh, yes, uh, I know that uh, Professor Veresa from our school uh, probably participated in that meeting, so you, you maybe met there. But look, um, uh, 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 I think that there is a lot of uh, the future in front of those labs, right? And, and uh, so uh, could be like interesting thing to, 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 to follow this. But, but maybe I could have also a question to uh, Wojtek and uh, Beata and uh, mm, James, right? Uh, uh, regarding your paper, because I quite often think if business schools are uh, products, right? Maybe, maybe it's 
it's a lot about business here. So maybe you would have some recommendation for business schools, which is like, which could be derived from your research in marketing, right? So my question is, is there an advice to UNR or SGH? How should we place our, our products on the, um, I mean, our education offer uh, on the market? Uh, maybe some recommendations? I think that's a very difficult question. I, I'm not prepared for that. Um, I mean, uh, surely, uh, you know, uh, students are consumers uh, of uh, university uh, services. So, uh, so uh, surely they they uh, they act according to behavioral mechanisms, and uh, and and we may think about it, but. Uh, Honestly, maybe James or Beata would like to share some ideas, but at the moment I, I don't uh, I don't have any recommendation. But it's interesting to to think about. Uh, yeah, because for because for instance, when I look at uh, our school, there is a lot of uh, discussion about the strategy, and we have recently formulated a motto. So SGH shapes leaders, right? This is something very important for the school leadership now. So I am wondering if this is somehow in line with some recommendations of marketing. Uh, you know, so I may, uh, because uh, several years ago, uh, when I, uh, when I uh, did my research for uh, my doctoral thesis, I, my, uh, my research uh, was about uh, students in, in, our, in our university, in Warsaw School of Economics, and it was about uh, psychological traits of those students and how those students are, um, are, um, are, are functioning um, uh, at uh, university. And uh, what interesting uh, was in, in those results is that um, uh, we had a cluster of uh, of our students who were um, uh, who who who, sh who uh, showed some symptoms of uh, fear of negative emotions, and uh, those uh, students uh, were characterized by. Um, by um, uh, low level of uh, extraversion. And the conclusion of, of this uh, results was that um, in business schools, uh, there is, uh, there is uh, we, we talk much about leadership, about, about uh, things that are connected with extraversion. So people who are uh, really extroverts Feel well, feel well in this uh, in this uh, environment, but there are also students in uh, economic universities who are introvert, and those uh, people are more uh, more oriented on uh, on uh, quantitative subjects and being um, um, analytical uh, people. Uh, in, 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 in their future career, and they may um, feel some sort of uh, uh, inconvenience when uh, they are surrounded by those, uh, by those uh, uh, slogans and, uh, and ideas that they have to be leaders. And when they are, uh, you know, by, by their psychological uh, traits, by their personality, they are not... Uh, uh, they are not inclined to be uh, leaders. They feel um, feel uh, feel some some kind of stress. So so maybe uh, this is not a hint to to for promotion, but maybe yes. Maybe when a university would say that okay, we we are for leaders, but also for other people. Uh, Analyticals, analytically skilled, or something like that, it could be uh, it could be attractive for those people. Uh, uh, James, uh, I, I thought you were going to say something. 
Oh, thank you, Mehmet. Uh, and thank you, Walsh Tech. Uh, one, one thing I would uh, consider for universities based on uh, the research uh, is to consider whether you're, you're being evaluated joint or separately. So if someone is searching specifically, say for Warsaw School of Economics, uh, you're going to want to present your, your key attributes in abstract uh, wording, right? So the top school, uh, you know, a top, uh, whatever your rankings are or your category. Um, but if you envision people that are less decided on the school that they want to go to, and perhaps they have more knowledge about the schools, for instance, graduate students or perhaps other faculty that are considering visiting the school or doing research with the, the, the people there, uh, you'll want to use more specific, uh, more concrete language, uh, especially if you're, uh, if you're better <laughs> than your competition. Uh, so for instance, in, in the US, we have, a, and, and elsewhere, of course, we have the Carnegie rankings, right? So we have R1, R2, uh, et cetera. Uh, UNR is at the bottom of R1. <laughs> okay. so, so you have to think about your competitive uh, positioning as well. So if I'm at the bottom of R1, I'm not going to put my ranking within that category. I'm going to say I'm R1. <laughs> I'm tier one, I'm R1 so that I can compete at the same level in terms of abstractness, right? So if someone is just looking at, at UNR, they go, oh, wow, they're an R1, that's great. Uh, but if they start comparing amongst the R1 schools and they look at the ranking, which would be more concrete, then I'm going to drop in the preference set. Um, and so we have to consider one, whether people are, are comparing across schools or they're already set on going to your school uh, and they just need a little bit more motivation. I kind of think of that as say like when I'm talking to my grandma or my mom, she doesn't care if UNR is you know top 100 or top 50 really. But if I say, no, it's a research focused school, uh, she, oh, that's great. Right? And so that's more abstract, uh, whereas the ranking would be more concrete. So one thing to think about there, and you can apply that too, you know, in, in terms of digital marketing, uh, thinking about, you know, how are people entering, getting to your landing page? So getting to your, your initial website from a link online, uh, and you can base it on the, the search patterns prior to that, and you can actually direct them to landing pages that are, that contain either uh, more concrete or abstract language. Uh, and you know to hopefully increase the probability of a click through uh, and getting more information from from your site. Yeah, uh, great point. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, so I, I also I know like we're uh, pretty much out of time, but I had a quick question for you know Wojtek, uh, you know Beata and James, uh, which is probably something that you maybe already uh, uh, like thought about. So I, I noticed that you're only. Uh, you, you only did this like with undergraduate students um, and, and of course you know like uh, you basically say well how about grad students how about like non-students so um, is, is that sort of like you know the next thing uh, you're planning to do uh, uh, yeah yes definitely it's not a representative sample of course um, now the category used headphones is is you know it's a pretty good sample given that product category, uh, but of course the more representative the the sample the the better. Uh, so future studies um, using online samples, say through Mechanical Turk or or similar, uh, will, are on the agenda. We need to get our results figured out first. <laughs> Well, you know, I would say I will say James, there are these two very nice research labs. <laughs> that that uh, that are like ready to help you guys so you know let us know like seriously um you know we'll be happy to of course you know support your research so uh you know it's uh, like you know fairly new initiatives on both ends but but we will like to expand and you know have more working groups definitely uh you know as part of the ME global you know one of them could be uh, definitely marketing related uh, i would love to have that thank you thank you very much Mehmet. Sure. Uh, okay. Thank you. So, we are we are very interested in this. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh, Wojtek, uh, you know, we'll we'll definitely be in touch. <laughs> mm -hmm.
Uh, okay, uh, so I think that's all the time we have. So that's uh, 10, 33 hour time. And uh, I believe it is uh, like, is it 7.30 uh, p.m. or like 7.33 p.m.? So um, the next session is, starts, uh, you know, in about 30 minutes. So that gives you a little uh, bit of time to, you know, like um, uh, have coffee, snack, you know, use the restroom and, and so on. So I'll see you in the, uh, um, like, you know, one of the, the next sessions, I guess. Thank you very much uh, to all presenters and to those that asked questions and, and uh, also to those just uh, attended and, and uh, watched us and listened to us. Thank you, Mahmoud. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye.